<clears throat> so this is a new section, um, which is uh, part three, um, buckling of compression members. Um, so let's go back to the to the start of the book. Um, <coughs> So it's going to be called um, buckling of compression members. So all of the course notes here um, have been taken from Megson. So in my opinion, Megson is still the best textbook. So if you need any more detail as to what's been provided in this section of the course, um, just feel free to return to Megson's book, um, Structural and Stress Analysis. Um, details are given here. So a lot of the stuff that you see in this Part of the course has been taken directly from that book. Um, we'll now move on to the prerequisites. Um, so to benefit from this part of the course on buckling, which is the instability, and to participate meaning, meaningfully, um, you need some prerequisites. So one of them is the free body diagrams, which we've talked about in the first part, in part one and two. Um, and you can, if you're unsure, you can always refer back to Wikipedia. So there's a Wikipedia link there. Um, there's the concept of equilibrium and calculation of support reactions, which we've all gone through. Um, axial and shear forces and bending moments, um, normal forces, um, section centroids, which we'll come on to, such as second moment of inertia, um, moment curvature relationships for beams and boundary conditions, and then some mathematics, um, second order, um, homogeneous and non-homogeneous differential equations. And as we've mentioned here, the self-study, um, you can always look back to Megson. And if you want another textbook, this one is the Timoshenko and Gear textbook, um, chapter six. Um, but do remember that some of these books would be using different sign conventions or possibly using different sign conventions um, from what we're used to. So table of contents um, for this bit. Um, we'll talk a bit about um, these about the terminology. Um, firstly, I've demonstrated in those videos just now what exactly Euler is. Um, so Euler or the elastic critical buckling load or P crit. Um, so we can write that out there. So Euler, um, if you if someone if an engineer says to you the Euler load, you will know what that means. Euler is the same as the elastic um, critical um, buckling load. And um, sometimes you see it referred to as PE, um, E being st E standing for Euler. Sometimes you see it as PCR, um, which is critical. So either P Euler, um, P PCR, and that is equal to pi squared. Um, we'll go through the proof later on, pi squared E. So E is the Young's modulus of the material, which for steel is about 200 or 205 times 10 to the three newtons per millimeter squared. So I'll just go um, for steel, um, E equals, or E is approximately 200 um, to 205 times 10 to the three newtons per millimeter squared. So let's just get rid of that. Um, so it's approximately um, 205 times 10 to the three newtons per millimeter squared, but sometimes you see it as 200, but it's all, all pretty much the same. Um, so that's um, P Euler, um, pi squared EI over L, and in this case here, it will, we'll call it the effective length. So I've just demonstrated what the effective length is. Um, for the different cases, so effective length um, squared, so the effective length squared, and um, the last thing is I, and I is going to be the second moment of area, um, otherwise known as the second moment of inertia, so, so or second, or sorry, not second, um, moment of inertia. So um, you've all studied um, how to calculate I um, back in um, Civil um, 210 with uh, Quincy and Lucas. So the calculation of I is something that you've already covered. Um, let's go back and through the course book and we will see that um, back here at the start when we did the basic skills stuff um, 
and also in the Zorro Q examples, um, it goes through or asks you to calculate the second moment of inertia of an I section about that axis or about that axis. Um, it also asks you to calculate some of the other section properties. So all of that is a recap and I'll leave you um, over the semester break um, to refresh yourself in terms of Civil 210 and what the second moment of inertia is. Um, if we flick through here, um, no, there's no, there's no more examples. I think there was one more. There was another one here. Oh, that probably it. Okay, but um, yes, yeah, so, so solutions are available um, for the basic skill test in 2014 um, to work out what the second moment of inertia is. So um, we'll just again have a recap. Um, a lot of times with steel structures, um, you will see this I section. Um, so I sections are used um, because the I shape um, is good for making connections. You can make a connection directly to the web or you can bolt through the flanges. Imagine if you had a box section like this and you were trying to, a more efficient section, um, and you were trying to make a connection through there and there, um, you don't have access um, to this side. Whereas here, if you want to make a connection, you've got fr your hand can go around here, so you've got free access. So I section is very common in steel and steel construction. So um, again, as a recap, um, there'll there'll be two axes, and it would be good if you were able to identify um, which ones they were. Um, so we'd use the term the strong axis. Um, because if it bends around the strong axis, it's stronger, or the second moment of area or the moment of inertia um, is larger than if it was bending about the weak axis. So um, you need to um, just recap and work out which, which of the two axes that your beam may be bending about or buckling about is the strong and the weak, um, because you have to do those calculations when you work out or try to work out what PCR is. So that explains what Euler is, and that explains what E is, and that explains what I is. Sorry, E is for steel, about 200 or 205 times 10 to the 3 newtons per millimeter squared. Um, just again, if you took some steel and you tested it in the materials lab, um, which we do at um, this university with the PhD students, um, you'd be plotting a graph of um, stress against strain. And um, for steel, it will go up like that, go like that, and then fracture. So that would be the failure. But this portion here, that is E, E is actually very, very hard to measure, which is why um, sometimes some people say it's 200 and sometimes people say it's 205. Um, so we'll just say E approximately 205 times 10 to the 3 newtons per millimeter squared but it comes from testing um, your bit of steel in one of the machines that we have at the university so that's your um, that's your stress strain curve so the examples that I've just um, shown um, the pin end columns so we look back here and hopefully this one will come out under the camera um, so your pin ended yep this one comes out so this one would be your pin ended um, which we can see there. Um, so we'll start off with the pin-ended column um, in order to develop our equation or develop what that one is. Um, we'll then talk about um, the effective length um, for the other support conditions. So I think I've just demonstrated what the other support conditions would look like and how the buckled shape um, would, would look. Um, I've mentioned just now what the effective length was as you change the other support conditions and then we'll come on to this concept of slenderness. And then after that, the advanced topics in column buckling. Um, as we said, the columns or the beam or the beam columns as they're sometimes known as. Um, <coughs> you can see when I push this here, it buckles in that direction, even though theoretically it could buckle in that direction at exactly the same load. 
And that's because in real life there is an initial camber or an initial bow or the thing is not in, or the thing is not perfectly straight or my support conditions start off with a slight angle. Um, all of these things affect things. Um, so that is um, imperfect support conditions which would um, theoretic which theoretically have well theoretically we're talking about perfect support conditions, but imperfect support conditions will have an effect on the behavior of these columns or the beam columns. Um, initial, initial lack of straightness, um, we'll come on to something called the Southwell plot, which is quite useful for calculating, um, for calculating the bucking loads in the laboratory. Um, we'll then talk about eccentric compressive loads. So eccentric compressive loads are when we were trying to, in the perfect column, to make that exactly along the same line, but in reality, sometimes your connections are a bit off center by one millimeter or something. So there is a bit of eccentricity normally to when the loads are applied. So that, that's what it means by eccentric compressive loads. Nonlinear and non-elastic material properties for the non-slender columns. So this is when we come on to design. So as engineers, we want to be able to design columns and we want to know what load they would fail at under design. Um, so we've got Rankine and then we've got the tangent modulus, uh, sorry, the tangent and reduced modulus theories. Um, but the one that everyone uses these days is known as the perry robertson formula. So in the old days, maybe 100 years ago, they were using Rankine, then it developed into something else. And today um, we're using um, the perry robertson formula, which is effectively just a curve fit um, to experimental test results accumulated in laboratories and universities all over the world. And then there's an appendix, um, properties of plane areas. So that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Um, right, okay, so let's let's move on. Um, so let's move on to the introduction. So you can read all this yourself. Um, structural structures and structural members may fail in some way. Um, so you all know about tension failure. Um, compression failure is different. In, if something fails into compression, um, it could be it could be buckling. So this part of the course um, deals with failures which take form of a sudden shape in the structure's configuration or a loss of stability when a structural member um, becomes unstable. It is said to buckle. So subject to axial load, there is very little difference um, between how a members fail in tension and compression. And this is shown here in this figure here where you've got the tension failure. Um, a member in tension fails when the direct stress exceeds the strength of the, mater of the material of the member. Um, but when it's a short column under compression, it will fail with the material being exhausted, squashed or squeezed. However, if you've got a long column like you've got like we've seen or a long beam column or strut it can fail before the material strength is exhausted so going back to these examples here um, if we set this was a hundred in in terms of the buckling in that direction if I pulled it in that direction there maybe it would fail at a thousand for example so buckling which is the instability can fail um, or can lead to your beam columns failing or your columns failing um, long before um, the material actually um, wants to fail in tension, as you see there, or um, here through crushing, which would be at about the same load. So a slender column, um, which is a long column, um, can fail or strut will fail long before the strength of the material is exhausted by sudden large lateral deflections from its equilibrium. Um, or stable condition, and that's known as buckling, which we've just demonstrated. Um, now, if we have um, a beam there, or a beam column, under compression load there, which you can see there, um, if I draw a graph of load against deflection, so I say that's going to be P, um, so up here, um, that one is going to be P, and then along here, that one is going to be axial shortening. Um, so axial shortening in that direction or deflection in that direction. So I'll just put a deflection there. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really matter which one it is. Um, let's just call it axial, axial movement um, or axial shortening. So you would expect it to, 
if, if you tested it in the lab, it will go up like that and then suddenly it will buckle. So that should be a straight line and then the deflections would shoot off to infinity. So buckling occurs at a very sharp load and then that one, not sharp load, it occurs very, it can occur very suddenly and that's known as um, PCR. So um, th this is what we're going to be calculating, PCR or P Euler, um, when the, when the um, column or the beam column buckles. So that's what we've got there with everything um, shooting. So that should be a straight line with everything shooting off to infinity. Now, I mentioned just now, or we saw just now, that um, we're going to be talking about imperfect support conditions, lack of straightness. So a real column is not perfectly straight. The support conditions are not perfectly frictionless. And so for a variety of reasons, also including the fact that when you manufacture these columns here, it is going to be locking in residual stresses as the steel cools um, in the factory. So for a lot of these reasons, um, we don't actually see that behavior, but we see a more rounded behavior like there, where that shoots and then reach that point and that shoots off to infinity. So of course that's a bit more exaggerated, but as the imperfections become smaller and smaller, um, it will become sharper and sharper, and then it will, um, for a perfect column, um, it will fail at the Euler load or the elastic critical buckling load, which is what we're gonna be calculating now. So um, next section, um, Euler buckling theory um, for slender columns. So um, by slender, um, what we mean is um, long columns. And again, just for the terminology, um, Euler buckling is also known as the elastic critical. So everything remains elastic and it's the elastic critical or ECR when everything suddenly becomes unstable. And as we mentioned before, that instability can occur long before the material wants to fail through yielding um, or in crushing. Okay, so Euler theory for long columns. So pin-ended columns. Um, so again, back to this example down there. So pin-ended columns, let's just rotate it around there so it actually looks like a column. They're actually, um, they're actually beam columns. Um, so we can, so just going back to this graph here that I mentioned, um, so as you increase the load, so if I could plot that, it would probably be more a rounded thing, um, but you don't need much more load beyond that and keep on pushing and suddenly it's going to buckle and everything would shoot off to infinity. Um, so here we've got exactly that condition. Um, so start by exploring the mechanics and the mathematics of buckling by analyzing um, a straight uniform a straight, so perfectly straight, perfectly uniform, long, um, with perfect support conditions being pin-pinned. Um, so pin-ended columns, um, seen here, or pin-ended beams um, of length L. And we assume that the column satisfies the Euler balloon theorem, i.e. plane sections remain plain and, obey, and normal to the um, column fibers after deformation and the material is homogeneous and obeys Hooke's law of, elas of elasticity or is linear elastic. So effectively, back to the civil two, 10 stuff, plane sections remain plane, and you can work out your stresses from sigma equals my over i. Um, the column, um, the column's young modulus is E, which for steel is between 200 and 205 times 10 to the three newtons per millimeter squared. And the cross-sectional second moment of area is I. So, I think we're just assuming that it might be might be a circular one or it might be a square one where I about the mate about the strong and the weak axis um is 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 going to be the same. So the axial load P is aligned perfectly. So again emphasize the word perfectly. So it's perfectly straight, perfectly uniform, perfect support conditions, and the forces come through perfectly through the longitudinal axis of the column, um, and this is called L, um, column length L, the, um, with the longitudinal centroidal axis of the column. So coming, you, you can see I've not drawn that perfectly, but um, imagine it was perfect and the, and the load is coming dead right in there, um, right through the centroid of the section. So this is the trivial case 
uh, when the column remains straight. Real columns are not trivial. Real columns have imperfections, and so real columns would behave like that. But um, an, an artificial, trivial case um, or theoretical case would be it just goes up and suddenly it shoots off to infinity. So the trivial case is when the column remains straight. Um, however, we acknowledge that it may buckle. So the trivial case is when it goes up along here until it reaches the buckling load and then shoots off. Um, empirically, um, we know, however, that it may buckle, i.e. lose its straight configuration. And then we assume that the column has lateral deflections in that direction there and is in equilibrium in this configuration. So under this elastic critical, under this load P, once it begins to deflect outwards, sorry, not deflect, buckle outwards, um, as we could see from any of these curves here, um, P against um, delta, um, it's in equilibrium. Um, so empirically, we know that it may buckle, i.e. lose its straight configuration. Um, assume then that the column has lateral deflection Vx and it's in equilibrium in this configuration. So um, as I again showed through the um, show just now, um, th this one here would be the trivial case where it just shortens without buckling and then suddenly it, and then suddenly it would buckle out, which we can see there. So suddenly it could buckle out into the buckled case. And in the buckled case, um, it would be in equilibrium. So we can now draw a free body diagram. Um, at this stage, I'll just preempt what um, what was say, what just refresh your memory. When we said that this one is going to buckle, we said it's gonna buckle in terms of sine waves or half sine waves. So obvious, um, so the deformed shape under buckling is considered to be a sine function. We'll see that in the match shortly, but it's different from when you've got loads coming down here when we did the slope deflection, when we said the deformed shape is a cubic. Here, the buckle shape is, um, half, sine, is half sine waves or sine functions. So um, let's, let's move on down there. So pin, 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 as we said, I'm um, subject to axial compression. And then here, this is in equilibrium. Um, the free body diagram um, for the buckled column. So again, um, let's say, so we've got that as being, let's consider that to be, let's consider that admit height to be delta. And I'll just draw the graph again. Um, so we've got P um, and then we've got delta, um, which we've got there. So that could be that delta or it could be the delta at the end. It doesn't really matter. So you keep on increasing P and then it would go up very close parallel to that ax going up to that axis. And then suddenly, um, so the stiffness would be EA, um, E would be the um, second moment, E would be the Young's modulus and A would be the, um, the cross-sectional area. And then suddenly it would shoot off to infinity. Um, so it was suddenly it would shoot off to infinity theoretically when everything is perfect, um, perfectly straight, perfectly uniform, perfect pin into columns, load applied perfectly down through the center. So theoretically it would shoot off to infinity. So this is all in the perfect world, which of course doesn't exist. So it's not real, but it's perfect, which is why we're about to be able to solve some mathematics for it. So, um, We've got this down here, um, so we've got P, um, it's now buckled, so it could have buckled in that direction there, the mathematics would still stand up, and don't worry whether it buckles like that or whether it buckles like that, because that deflection is along any portion along there, any portion along there, once it's reached this, um, once it's reached this P Euler or PCR, which we're trying to calculate, it would shoot off to infinity. So don't worry too much about it going that side or that side, um, it's the same, or whether the deflection is more or more. Once it's reached that P Euler, which we're gonna be calculating um, using these equations, everything is going to shoot off to infinity. So um, we examine the moment curvature relationship of this, and then we could see that um, EI, um, which is the bending stiffness, 
um, times the deflection deflected shape. So um, Vx would be the deflected shape along the axis there. Um, so along the along the length. So let's just say um, the length is going to be starts from zero up there and it ends up as L up there. So VL um, V as a function of x at a distance of l so that would be the x-axis oh it's drawn there so that would be the x-axis x is zero there and x is l there so when x is equal to l which is right at the top at the pin condition vl equals zero so um, same as with the slope deflection we're saying that that point doesn't move and it's only rotation that's allowed and then we'll say at this end here, V, um, which would be zero in this case, is going to be equal to zero. So the deflection in that direction at the pin end is, of course, zero. And the deflection in that direction at the pin end is at the distance L, when X equals L, is, of course, going to also be equal to zero. So setting up our moment curvature um, relationship, um, EIV um, double dash X, um, and that is going to be equal to minus m um, times x. So d don't get too fussed about, about the negative sign. <coughs> We're just saying we've got equilibrium here. So we've got p acting through the column. So of course, once it's buckled, um, the p would be going down. So if we take v as a function of x at any point, um, you've got your p there, you've got your p there, there's going to be a distance between those two. And of course, there's going to be um, a bending moment um, at, um, at any point along there. And the equation, so we're trying to work out what v, what v as a function of x is, and it's going to be equal to, um, it's going to be equal using moment curvature, is going to be equal to m as a function of x. Now, of course, um, we know that um, and it could have been in the other direction, so don't get too fussed up about the sign. Now, m as a function of x, um, this p is coming down there, this p is going up there. So, of course, um, the mx um, is going to be equal to p um, times v as a function of x. So, v as a function of x is that distance there, and the moment at bending moment at any point is going to be equal to the force that the axial force that you've applied um, multiplied by the distance um, vx. So let's move and of course remember the boundary conditions that we're going to be putting in. I remember of course we've already seen from the deformed shape of the 3D printed toy that it's all going to turn out to be a sine function. So examining the moment curvature relationship um, to calculate the bending moment at an arbitrary point, I think we've explained that, take equilibrium with respect to the bottom, we've got an eccentricity, so mx equals pvx. Um, substituting that value into that equation up there, and that's why we have the negative sign, just to make our life easier, we end up with eiv double dash x plus pvx equals zero. Now, um, you should, of course, recognize that this is a linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. I'm not going to be testing you on the mathematic or the derivation, so don't worry. Um, but you can go back to look at your previous notes in mathematics, which I've also stuck on the Dropbox. Um, the way you solve that is you introduce a parameter alpha squared equals P over EI. Um, substitute your alpha back into there. Um, using a trial solution of vx e r to the x and substituting back there gives you your two roots uh, where one is imaginary and then equation four thus has the real solutions v as a function of x equals a sine alpha x plus b cosine alpha x. Um, all of that um, anyway um, you could have predicted without having to go through this because we saw we see here um, that when we apply the axial force, you can probably see you're quite happy to say that's a sine function, and you're probably quite happy to say that this one here is a sine function. So, 
so the sine, let's make it go like that so you can see the sine function going down. So you didn't even need to um, worry about the mats um, to be able to say, I think my V as a function of X is going to be equal to a sine function and therefore it's a constant sine alpha X plus B cosine alpha X. Now, um, we don't need to worry um, about this anyway, because we could have said it's going to be a sine, not a cosine, um, because if we go back here, um, we're saying that's a sine function, or we're saying that, or we're saying that's a sine function, um, which would be the same as that one anyway. So it's a sine function um, that we're talking about, and zero and L up there. So we could say that the B actually disappears. So um, we'll see that anyway through the maths. So by considering the boundary conditions, V naught equals naught, V L equals L. So plug that into the boundary conditions and um, B disappears. Your B becomes zero. So um, that disappears, um, leading to A sine alpha L equals um, zero, which of course is the sine function with the magnitude A um, going, um, going through. So firstly, um, there's a trivial solution. Um, so the trivial solution is that solution there going along that axis when the beam column um, just compresses, compresses like here. Um, and then this is the other solution or the non-trivial solution, which is the buckling solution. So the trivial solution, of course, can be satisfied when A equals zero. Um, <coughs> which corresponds to the all zero case when the beam remains straight. However, it's also non-trivial, non-zero solutions. Alpha L is equal to N, one, two, three, four, five. So since alpha, since alpha squared equals P of VI, the above condition is satisfied only when the axial force takes on some specific or critical values. Um, and this would be N, N squared, um, pi squared EI over L squared, and to each critical load corresponds a particular shape um, that the buckling um, could assume. So VN is equal to A sine N pi X over L. So let's try and translate that. Um, so we've got, so this is, called, this is an eigenvalue solution, by the way. So the first solution would, the first mode would be that one, which is the one that we want. Um, the second mode would be it buckling into two half sine waves. And the third mode would be equal to it buckling into three half sine waves. And you can go on to infinity. But as with engineering, we're just interested in the lowest value um, because we can see that for the first buckling mode, um, let's just pretend that it buckled at pi squared EI over L squared, that was 100. The second buckling mode is going to be four times higher than that. And then the next one is going to be nine times higher than that. So we're just interested in N equals one, which is the lowest one, because all these other ones are going to be much higher. So in practice, unless we specifically restrain the column during loading, it will always buckle at the first opportunity into the lowest one. So let's have a look here. Um, so the lowest load for this one here, where that's just to join, is one half sine wave. So that's the lowest one. But here we've restrained it from buckling. Here we've restrained well, we've restrained that point from moving in that direction, which you would have seen there. And as a result, it would buckle like that. So you only so that would be n equals two. So you only get um, you only get that case when you've got a restraint, a restraint acting there, or a restraint acting there. So don't worry about those too much. Or for now, um, we'll talk about them later. But for now, we're just interested in n equals one. So in practice, um, unless we, we specifically restrain the column, we're going to get n equals one, and then pi, and then p c r one or p Euler, um, so p e p Euler <coughs> is going to be pi squared e i over l squared. I'm taking on a half sine half half sine shape, um, a sine pi x over l. 
So from now on, while referring to the critical load, unless otherwise stated, we mean the lowest one. And so we'll simply drop that um, suffix, which you can see there, and just say PCR equals pi squared EI over L squared. And that goes back to where we started right here. Um, PCR is pi squared E, second moment of area, which would be about the weaker axis, <coughs> unless you've told it's been restrained about the weaker axis, over the L effective squared or the L, the L squared. So in this case here, the L effective, um, in this case here for this one there, the L effective is the same as the L. So columns with other support conditions. Um, so table two summarizes the values for the other support conditions. And we can repeat the mathematical process to work out the 205. We could repeat the mathematical process to work out the four um, or the 0.25 or the 0.25 here. Um, and this one is the same or one. So if you change your support conditions, so you've now changed this end from pin to roller, your buckling load or the elastic critical buckling load has increased by a factor of 2.05. If you, if you make both ends fix fixed, it's increased by a factor of four. Um, we'll prove this later on. Um, if you've got a cantilever with that, so that point is free to move, it's 0.25. If you've got this one where it's free to slide in that direction, it's 0.25. And then if you've got this one here where this end is fixed in, um, it's um, back to one. So um, the other way to describe it is instead of talking in terms of what PCR is, um, engineers would be talking in terms of the effective length. So this one here buckles into one half sine wave. So that would be the effective length effective length of L, sometimes you would say an effective length of one, which means one times L. This one has an effective length of 0 0.7. So as I show it with the model, maybe that point is the contraflexure, it's the point of contraflexure. And then if you measure that line there, um, you might find that it's about 0 0.7. Um, this one here, effective length of 0.5 L, which means, you know, maybe two points of contraflexure there. And then that one being half, um, half of the um, half of the length. So if the overall length was one, the buckling load is four times. If you compare to the pin pin case, um, when you make it fix fix, or the effective length is 0.5, which means if you wanted to work out the buckling load of that, um, PCR would be equal to pi squared EI over 0.5 L squared. And we can immediately see you point, you square that 0.5 becomes 0.25, one over 0.25 is your four. So you can see the relationship between there anyway. So we'll just proceed anyway. So you've got your two, your 0.2, your two and your 0.25 and your one and your one. So engineers lingo is talking about in terms of effective length. Okay. So um, this question here, example one, says um, find the elast find the critical load or elastic critical buckling or Euler load and the buckle shape for a column with one end fixed, one end fixed and the other end on a roller. So it's asking us to do the calculation um, to find out um, that the effective length is 0.7. And it and also that um, that value is um, two point oh five. So um, to go through that solution, um, I've got uh, some YouTube links where I narrated a solution before, so that was my solution. Um, I've also got Quincy's solution, and Quincy's solution um, is also on the Dropbox. So Quincy's solution is um, a weeb is a bit different from my solution. Um, and I'll choose to go through Quincy's solution later on, and you can have a look at my solution. It's just a bit slightly different in terms of the maths. Um, so, but again, Quincy's solution is also put onto the Dropbox. So I'll be going, um, so Quincy's solution on the Dropbox um, would be um, 
going. So I'll just talk, I'll just narrate you through that um, next time and I'll um, show you how you can work out um, that 2.05 um, 2.05 factor. Okay. So, and then this one here, on, also on the Dropbox, is my narrated solution. So, next time I'll be going through the solution quickly. And um, as I've already said, I will never be asking you to prove um, these values in the exam. So, the proof is just there for you to see, but you don't need to reproduce. Don't feel under pressure that you need to be able to reproduce the proof um, under exam conditions at a later date.